Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our story of Pensacola, the western gate to the Sunshine State, the North America's first city. In these stories, we've been de detailing of all of the occasions that brought these 450 years of ours and more into focus. And today we begin with the British period. Now, the British period came about almost as an accident. Uh, as the circumstances uh, presented themselves, the French and the British had been at war on a worldwide basis for some years. This is what our American history books often call the French and Indian War. They, those battles had been fought in India, in Canada, along the eastern coastline, and of course in the Caribbean Sea. And as they reached 1762, the French were, were losing. And so they appealed to their Spanish cousins. And of course there was a, a Bourbon king on the throne in Spain. The, the French were asking for help and the Spanish agreed. Well, almost immediately, the British rerouted a great fleet away from a, a, an objective they had had in the Caribbean, and they sent it on to, to lay siege to the city of Havana, Cuba. Now, we can't quite appreciate that today, but in those days, Havana was the crown jewel of all of Spain's Latin American holdings. And the siege, of course, went on for about 90 days, when ultimately the British prevailed and they captured the city, which was a, a terrible blow to the Spanish. Uh, just weeks later, the war came to an end. And as they approached the peace table, of course, the question was, what will these, the British be willing to take to give Havana back? And the Spanish were willing to do almost anything, but they had very little that the British wanted. And so as they sat around the peace table, they went back and forth, and finally they agreed that they, the British would return Havana and be given in return all of Florida, from the Keys to the Mississippi River. And that was the way things went. Well, as it turned out in, in, in Whitehall in Britain, the British really didn't want Florida. They, they had said that it was populated by a, a handful of uh, settlers on the East Coast and a few at Pensacola. There were Indians and swamps and mosquitoes. They didn't want it. It made no, 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 had no strategic hold for their long-range plan. But they finally agreed to take it. And so in August of 1763, the first contingent of British arrived here. They were a company of Marines, and they were led by a Major Robert Farmer. Uh, Major Farmer's objective, of course, was to meet with the Spanish to outline what would happen to these settlers here, and also to make a survey of what British was actually, they were actually getting at Pensacola. And he sent a very brief report back to Whitehall, and I'm going to take just a moment to, to read you what Major Farmer said. It'll give you an idea of what, in his view at least, Pensacola looked like in those days. And he said, the town has about 100 huts and the country, uh, countryside suffers from the insufferable laziness of the Spaniards. The fields remain uncultivated, woods are close to the village, and only a few paltry gardens show improvement. The climate is not healthy, the soil is poor. The land farther back is capable of improvement, but there is no stock, the people having been supplied almost entirely from Mobile. And that's the story that Major Farmer sent back to London. Well, of course, getting things organized, then what took an, the next step, an intermediate step, was what would happen to the Spanish people, the roughly 250 settlers who were here? And so the, the British came to them and said, look, we want to have you stay. We'd like you to have, become citizens of Britain. We'll protect your property rights. We'll protect your, your, your citizenship. Only one proviso, however. You must join the Church of England. Well, virtually all of these Spanish folks were Catholic, and they refused to do this, and so little by little they were evacuated, meaning that the British had to totally repopulate the entire colony they were taking over. And so the, all of this was placed in the trust of what was known then as the Board of Trade, and uh, Lord Robert Butte, B-U-T-E, Butte was the, was the, the head of the, the board, and he immediately went to work in a very positive way. He said, well, uh, we've gotten reports that West Florida is not exactly the garden spot of the world. We've got to make it attractive to people. And so they did this by what I would today call subsidies. Now, number one was a subsidy on getting people to move here to Pensacola. And basically, what they said was this. We, we will give you, if you're a professional man or, or a tradesman, we will give you property for, your, uh, for a, a home, uh, property for a, a building for your business, and we will also pay your expenses for you and your family all to move to, to Pensacola. And uh, most, a lot of people said this, this sounds pretty good because times were not good back in, in England. And a number of people said, we will come. And so we began to get bakers and wig makers and, uh, and carpenters and all of the people, the 
were so essential to building a society. And secondly, the, the second part of the, uh, of the arrangement that the Lord Butte began dealt with the land along the Mississippi River. It was already known to be very rich uh, soil, very excellent uh, agricultural land. And so he turned to people in Britain who had money. And he said, now I'll tell you what we're going to do. If you will, we will give you we will give you in land along the Mississippi 1,000 acres for every person whose expenses you pay who will go out there and become a citizen of British West Florida. 1,000 acres per person. And so people, uh, some people who had money began to make such investments. They did so in lots of 10,000 and 20,000. The largest one was about 50,000 acres. And all of these people, of course, ultimately uh, settled along the Mississippi. They, they became very successful farmers. And in time, they began to build little villages right on the, on the river itself. These were what we were today called farm to market uh, villages. And this is where such towns as Natchez and Manchek and Fort Butte came into existence and became very successful over the roughly 20 years of the British time. Well, back in Pensacola, the first man to be assigned here as the royal governor was named George Johnstone. Johnstone was a retired naval captain. Uh, his family was from northeastern England, and they were very, very successful people. His father was a, a, a most successful landowner. And one thing that was of great interest was the father had as a good friend a man who was making quite a name for himself at the new University of Glasgow. He was an economist, and his name was Adam Smith. And so our friend George Johnstone, the new governor, would sit around listening to his father and Adam Smith talk about economics and uh, the fact that the British mercantile system was which was in existence then, really didn't make sense because that system said that anything that went to or from, any product that went to or from a British colony had to be shipped in a British vessel, which excluded, of course, French or Spanish trade. And Adam Smith uh, was, was extolling the idea of free trade, and George Johnstone, of course, was listening. Well, Johnstone and his wife arrived in Pensacola early in 1764, as, as a few other people were beginning to arrive as well. Johnstone looked around at what the, uh, the village that uh, Robert Farmer had seen, and he agreed. He said, this, this just will not do. We have got to make Pensacola, uh, we've got to make it over on the, on the pattern of what we have been building in our settlements along the Atlantic coastline. Now, of course, we're talking now 1763, and at this, by this time, the English had 12 ongoing, excuse me, 13 ongoing settlements from uh, the, the Hampshire grants all the way south to include uh, Savannah, Georgia on the south. So uh, J Johnstone was well aware of what the English were doing, the kind of pattern they had set for life, the kind of uh, trade they had and also the kind of governance that was present in some of those settlements. So he, he looked at the village here in Pensacola and said, this just will not do. Stop. We just won't, we'll just make do until we lay out a new city. And for that, I have to have an engineer. So he uh, sent a message quickly back to Lord Butte and said, please send me a qualified engineer. And the, uh, the, the Lord Butte did that. The man who arrived along with his wife named, was, a, 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 was a, a young lieutenant of uh, artillery, an engineer by the name of Elias Durnford. Uh, Durnford came with his wife and settled in. He looked around and he totally agreed with George Johnstone. And so Durnford went to work as a surveyor and he laid out a new, totally new city. Now, the city as we know it today, from east to west along the waterfront, is ex almost exactly what Elias Durnford gave us. He laid out the streets, he laid out the squares. Of course, there was already in place what had been the Spanish fort, and he built, uh, he built, Durnford built his arrangement around that, and all of the streets, north and south, east and west, uh, were configured in the in English pattern. And of course, they, they put you know, new names, and I have to give you an idea of what the names were, because the, this was a totally English settlement. And of course, many of the streets were named after people who were prominent in British politics at the time, and even uh, uh, Durnford was even politically wise enough to name one street after the governor, George Johnstone. So we had Johnstone Street running east to west, right close to the waterfront. Now, one street was named for King George, another was named for Lord Butte, another was named for Queen Charlotte, and other names like, like Gloucester and Cumberland, all, all part of the English hierarchy at that time. They were affixed, and they became our original street names in the, the current downtown Pensacola. Now, as he did all of this, of course, Durnford laid out the, the lots 
And when the proper time came, the next step in what they did was to, uh, uh, to present lot, uh, lot, deeds to lots to all of those people who had been promised this sort of thing when they agreed to come. So every person got his building lot, every, or every tradesman got his, uh, his professional lot, and of course there was, there was a preference. Those in the higher government positions got the lots closest to the water where the, where the breezes were good, and the others were moved inland. So if you were a, if you were a carpenter, you got a, a lot for your house, a lot for your, home, for your business, and then every Every family also got a lot for a garden, and all of these garden plots were in a, str in a, st a steady string from east to west, and Mr. Durnford was wise enough to pipe water from the little spring and stream on the west side of the city, and that, that water, of course, came to, to help water the gardens, and all of these, uh, these uh, plots prospered, and that's why we have Garden Street still today. Now, for water supply, there was a creek running down the west side of the village, and this was very carefully protected. Uh, Mr. Durnford t made a takeoff of, of a kind of an aqua Aqueduct almost that came down into the center of the city, and, though, and then of course a place was set up for all the women to wash their clothes. The, the housewives would come to a place below the water takeoff, and that's where the laundry was done in the in the new community. So we have this the city nicely set up. Uh, people came in, our, our population began to increase, and so the first stage had been set. Stage two was something to help build the economy. Now, of course, the English to this point had been quite successful in dealing with the Indians, particularly in the southeast. And so uh, they rec it was recognized now that there, the, by the Treaty of Paris, which set up Pensacola as being, a, or, or Florida, as being a British area, the treaty also made provision for special lands to be set aside for the Creeks, the Choctaws, the, the Cherokees, to the north of, of this area of Florida. And now Indian tribes, which had been pretty much north of there, began to move a little bit more south and we have these tribes moving closer and closer to Pensacola. And now the, uh, jo Governor Johnstone invited into the area a man who was to become the Indian agent. And his name was John Stewart. Now, Stewart had been a very successful Indian agent in the Carolinas. He came here with the, uh, the understanding that his job was to establish a trade with the Indians to trade British manufactured goods for, high, for hides, for skins, for, for furs, uh, which the Indians would provide. The first meeting of the Indian tribes came here late in the, uh, late in the fall of, eight, of 1764. And here Stuart met with almost a thousand of these tribal leaders. Now, all of this was paid for by, of course, by the British government. And Governor Johnstone, of course, from, from, came from northeastern England. He was, he was a little bit of a Scot as well as being an Englishman. And it just bothered him terribly that he had to spend a thousand English pounds on all of the entertainment for the tribes. But they came, they settled up. And of course, we have to visualize today where they went. They, there was open ground right down on the waterfront, and this is where the Indians came in. They, they came in by, by any means of transport they could find. They pitched their tent, and most of them were here for two or three weeks, and they, they set up the arrangement by which the trade would carry on. And this was the beginning of the great Indian trade which, which would, would prevail here in West Florida over for the next 50 years. So we credit John Stewart with that. So now, at the end of this for first two years, we've had Johnstone arriving, we've had Mr. Durnford arriving, we have, we've laid out the city, and now the preparations were in place for the economy. The uh, agricultural people are arriving along the Mississippi River, and so the colony is beginning to, to put itself together. And of course, as this done, as this is done, all of the things that have that are used by the homemakers and everyone else, almost all of this has to come from England. But the the next thing, of course, that the English did as they arrived here, they began to clear, began to clear la land just north of about where we would call Dr Gregory Street today. They began to cut down trees and began to make provision for agricultural work there. So you had the the family gardens. You have agriculture a little bit to the north of that. You have vessels arriving here periodically with supplies coming from England. And of course, Mr. John. Johnstone, right at the very beginning, now begins to eye the possibility of trade with the Spanish over in Louisiana for our work because he wants to have a, an opportunity to make some money as well as being the governor. So that's where things stood at the end of the first two years of the English period.